I'm the lead developer on a software called uh, Lightspeed Point of Sales. That's what POS means. Um, and uh, we're based in Montreal, but we have uh, offices in Ghent, which is kind of nice. Um, I also organize, uh, co-organize NS North, which has had three iterations so far. Check out our website. And some of you have stickers, and then I ran out. Uh, I also have a podcast in French called Cacao Cast, which is a French podcast about cocoa. And we're the number one French podcast about cocoa. Pretty much the only French podcast about cocoa. <laughs> we, we have uh, 152 episodes. So since 2009, every two weeks, that's commitment. Not Lex Friedman commitment, but it's pretty good commitment. Uh, some grand rules for today. Um, so this talk is not about changing the App Store rules. This is not about, I want to make a trial on the App Store. How do I do that, hacking around that? Um, it's not really about the Mac App Store versus self-distribution, because this is a Mac and iOS conference. Um, this assumes that you're familiar with Michael Jurowitz or Jury's uh, talk and or series of blog posts, which can be summarized by, think of a price and then double it. That's kind of the, uh, the gist of his talk. And uh, all of these slides and the bibliography that I have are all on GitHub, so I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, um, to read that on the, read through the bibliography and read the blog posts, read the articles and that in detail, it's all referenced. So really, you know, if you had dropped your phone, it would have cost you a lot more than, you know, uh, just the eight pounds for this app. So how many times have you guys seen something like this? But really first, I want to start with a small confession. Because um, this talk has been bouncing around my head for a while, about a year. And when I pitched this to Stuff back in January, it seemed like it was maturing enough that I felt confident I could give it. Um, but in February, <laughs> all hell broke loose, and everybody started talking about this. So it's no, it was no longer fresh. Um, I was at the forefront of a trend. So basically, I will use this to my advantage. I come from academia. And uh, in academia, we do research. I have two master's degrees, one in microbiology and one in ecology. So basically, here's my research. And of course, it is peer-reviewed by anonymous reviewers, which kind of describes the internet, right? So um, I, I won't talk about all of these, but you will have all of these in my bibliography, and you can take a look later for all the details. Um, so first, let's start with QBranch. They were the first to publicly announce that they were going to a higher price. And to my knowledge, they did not get flogged publicly for doing so. Uh, their App Store reviews, if you look at them, they're mostly five stars, with a few one stars here and there for people that don't like opinionated software. They don't like the font, they don't like the simplicity, um, and it's not really about the price anymore. Um, you will also note that Brent Simmons, which is one third of QBranch, has actually left QBranch. He works for Omni full time. Omni is a fantastic company. They make fantastic software. You should buy their software. But um, if you read between the lines, my impression is that Vesper did not bring in enough money for three people to uh, get a, a living out of it. Um, so when these numbers, not these numbers, but when these decisions came out, uh, um, Milan from um, Health Tone posted a, a really nice blog post about how this environment that we're creating, this race to the bottom of the developers, was actually toxic to the developers. It was really good for Apple, but it's really, and because they're, they're selling more devices, but if you're a developer trying to make a living out of this, it's really hard. Some people are lucky. They hit a lottery. This is Monument Valley. How many of you know Monument Valley? There we go. So, wonderful game. Uh, won some Apple Design Awards, published a nice infographic, which is also in my bibliography, this is just one part of it, about what kind of revenue they made with this um, and what kind of costs they had. You have a revenue of 5.8 million here and their expenses are about 1.4, which gives you about, you know, 4.4 4, 4 .4 million profit, which seems like a lot. But then again, you realize they have a team of eight and they're based in London. Assuming that they're splitting eight ways, that's 500,000 each, which you know, it's not nothing to sneeze at, but also they're living in London, so their expenses might be significantly high, the cost of living and stuff, and then you add taxes and stuff like that. So these guys won the lottery for by all public accounts, but then again, they didn't really um, 
make something that seems sustainable. And they also have reviews that are like, this game is too short or uh, things like that. They still have the, the bad side of it even though they hit the lottery. One thing that was hidden in Panic's very public escape from the Mac App Store inside of their reviewing blog post is that they realized that their revenue from iOS was dwarfed by the revenue from the Mac. Um, they actually had about the same number of customers on each, so they were very popular in iOS, but the revenue coming from iOS was not that high. And of course, more customers means more support costs and more, more calls and things like that. So they were thinking, is it really worth it to be on the iOS store? So this is not really about their exit from the Mac App Store. This is more about uh, you can maybe make more money if you make Mac software because you can charge more. And that's kind of the gist of my talk. You can charge more. Um, there are some good news. Uh, uh, how many of you know, know Overcast or Marco? So uh, Marco wrote a podcast client and uh, he put, he published the numbers and, and good for him and good for us because now we can get a feeling for what's going on within what we all consider to be a very successful launch and a very successful app. Um, so these numbers, I'll return to them later, but they're all, they're all in his blog post. This is just a gist of his blog post. Um, they, they seem to be really good, but when you dig a little bit deeper, they, uh, you might want to have something that's sustainable. Compare and contrast to Jared Sinclair, who is the maker of Unread. Unread is an RSS reader, so it's a similar problem domain, problem, problem domain as it is for, uh, for Marco, because uh, Overcast is a podcast client. There's a bunch of other podcast clients, and it's about data that are getting, uh, getting uh, user-generated data uh, to your device and reading it, uh, consuming it over time. So an RSS reader is kind of the same thing. It has, uh, it's all text-based, of course, and maybe some images, but it's about getting a stream of information to your device and reading it over time. And they both have a lot of competitions. They both have a lot of comparables. Uh, one did pretty well, overcast, and the other one did less well, unread. And they're both really well designed. They both uh, uh, are stable applications that you would find to be at home on your iOS 7 or iOS 8 devices. Uh, but Jared actually had to sell this app to another company and go back to work full time. He could make the indie lifestyle work. Which brings me to from the literal ivory tower of research to my figurative ivory tower. So my disclaimer is I am not an indie developer. I work for Lightspeed uh, and I do this as a hobby. I don't depend, my livelihood doesn't depend on the apps that I'm going to show you. And the, there's a lot of these that are scratch, actually all of these are scratching my own itches, which is great when you're doing hobby development not so great when you're doing professional development. I, I don't really, my own itch was not to develop a point of sale system, but it pays the bills really, really well. Um, so uh, that disclaimer being out of the way, here are my apps. Uh, I'm gonna talk about four apps, um, and they all illustrate my point in some way. Uh, Daylight is free on the Mac App Store, and the, I, they're all iOS apps. Um, Daylight is free uh, and is available on the, uh, on the App Store. You can download it today. And the other two apps, uh, there's basically two other apps, TrainScan, which I'll talk later about, and uh, STO Synchro, which is a bus, app, uh, bus schedule application. So Daylight, it's, it's my first app. It's a very simple sunrise and sunset calculator. It's been on the App Store since 2009, so that's why I was able to get a name like this, which is really short, which really helps with my SEO. Uh, original name in my project is Twilight, and that didn't go through to Mac App Store. I, the App Store, I don't know why. Um, really, my, my, I've localized this in three languages, so French and English, but also German, because I have a German-speaking friend who was in Ottawa at the time and said that he would like to do this. And really, German users are the best users. Uh, they are polite, they are enthusiastic, they, they love it when you reply to your stuff and they give you suggestions, they give you encouragement. Uh, I get most of my support requests from German users, but they're all super fun to work with. Um, so I literally got this yesterday. Um, so I, just to illustrate my point, I have other ones on my backlog, but I took the latest one. So if, you're not, if you don't speak German, uh, I have the Google translation and I have the uh, Alex translation. Thanks, Alex. Um, so you can say, I, I kind of like the Google translation a little bit more because uh, in the Google translation, it, it bothers him 
but in the uh, Alex translation, he's annoyed. So the, the Alex one is really German, the other one is kind of like smoother. So um, I'm going to show you some stats that are pulled from Sunday. So from iTunes Connect, the new statistics stuff, so that's why it only goes back 90 days, just to give you an idea. Um, I have a pretty good conversion rate from people that look at the app on the App Store to an actual download. That seems decent to me anyway for a free app. Um, and it's got uh, quite a few users. Uh, the App Store reviews are usually pretty good. Um, it has um, the most important request because really it's my biggest app. I have about $40,000 downloads overall since the beginning. Um, uh, I, the name recognition is pretty good because it's got a good, good SEO, as I said. Um, this is again from iTunes Connect. Uh, again, my German users are at the top. Um, there's, there's data that shows that there were, I'm everywhere, but in iTunes Connect, it's just the most recent stuff because they just pulled out these analytics, so that's what I have. Um, so, so that's the free app that has a lot of competition, and, but that seems to do really well for, uh, in the App Store. Much more interesting to this, to this talk is um, STO Synchro. So the STO is Société de Transport de l'Outaouais. It's, it's the bus transit system from my town. They don't have open data. They have a website that is impossible to bookmark because it's all, uh, all the URL are base64 encoded and time dependent. So uh, I have to scrape their website every three months or so to get this, the bus schedule. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, and it started as a paid version because uh, the synchro part is I scrape their website, I make a JSON file, put it on my server, and I have the clients ping the server periodically to see is there an update, is there an update. And when I push an update to the server, all the clients get it so that when the schedule changes, uh, people have the updated summer schedule, for instance. Um, the problem is, since it's a, not an official app, people think it's an official app, so I get support requests saying, like, my bus was late, my driver was rude, and, uh, and uh, things like that, or I was late uh, arriving to work, so I had, was late paying for a daycare and stuff like that, it's all your fault. And, um, not as pleasant as the other one, and that has increased a lot ever since the free app. Um, because this app started as a paid app, it's old enough that Apple didn't allow uh, freemium back then. You could have a free app that had an in-app purchase uh, in there. It was just not allowed. People, some people might remember that rule. It seems weird now, but that's what it was. Um, but when I did the free app, what I did is a version that didn't ping my server at all. Like it's just a static, static list. The idea being that if you, paid a, if you paid a fee to unlock all the features and get essentially the same as the, the paid app, uh, you would get the schedules that are up to date immediately. You would get favorites and things like that. And it seemed to be a reasonable compromise of getting some kind of conversion rate going. Um, so things have changed for this app. Uh, the, uh, the, the STO might get open data this fall, but they've been to telling me that for a long time. So I'm not holding my breath and I'm still having my stupid scraping uh, system that actually drives Firefox and it's really complicated. You don't want to see that. Um, but the, the most interesting thing about this is I applied the jury experiment to this app, which is take your price and double it. And I doubled it to $4.99. Well, it's not really double, but it's just a higher tier. I also lowered it to 99 cents because there was another app that was 99 cents. Um, didn't see, d dropping it to 99 cents didn't change anything. I had, didn't have more downloads and have more conversions. I have it's had essentially the same number, so less money overall. And when I doubled it, what happened was people started sending me mail saying, this is way too expensive, like actual support email saying, I'm not buying this because they can't leave a review, right? Um, actual support email saying it's too expensive. I, this, this app sucks uh, for what it does because it's fairly simple. You know, I can't scrape the complete database. I just have the overall view. Um, and the reason was, there's other apps out there that do transit. This is not the only one, of course. It's the only game in town for uh, my city because there's no other app for my city. But they say, hey, I have the ST your app for uh, Getno, and uh, I have uh, the Ottawa app, which is the official OC transport application, which is much better than my app because they've got GPS data from the buses, which is awesome. But people say, well, the Ottawa app is so good. Why, why does your suck in comparison? I emailed them, I don't have the data. <laughs> I can't do anything, but still, I have, there's comparables. There's even free apps. How many of you know the Transit app? 
All right, a few people. If you travel, or uh, there, the transit app is fantastic because it looks at open data, and it will give you bus schedules for any city that has open data, which is fantastic. And it's free. I have no idea how they make money. Um, but look at this. These are the recent stats for STO Synchro Plus, which is the free version. This conversion rate is insane for downloads to, from App Store views to downloads. This tells you I'm the only game in town. Like when people search for STO bus in the App Store, they find me and they download that because it's free, right? It's really the power of free. That's really fantastic. Um, the, uh, if you look at the usage, uh, this is fabric.io, so uh, the, the Twitter stuff that I, Twitter analytics that I integrated, just to get a little bit more insight about what's going on. Um, so uh, this was on Sunday because I was waiting for the plane and I got so Sunday data would not be that interesting. Week data is much more interesting, but I just didn't think of doing it while I was here. Um, so you can see that there's a, quite a lot of users. Um, but uh, if I just go back to the other slide, you can see that my revenue over 90 days is $23. There were, not, there were like eight conversions out of 700 downloads, right? So not a lot of people bought into the full freemium things and, and wanted to, to, to balance this. But look at the power of free. This is, this is the, the slide with the uh, usage. And look at the left number at 344. I'm going to switch over to the STO Synchro, not the plus version, just a basic, you buy it, you get everything. All right? Not the same at all. So this is the paid app. And of course, I have two SKUs on the app store. It's a bit confusing, but um, the, the, I, I don't want to merge them. It would, it's going to take time. So free is really compelling. Freemium, in my case, not so much. So last one is TrainScan. This is an app that if you're not in Canada, you have no idea what it does. Um, basically, when you take the train in Canada for using via rail, you get an email, which is great, an email ticket, which contains a QR code, which is great as well, because then you can just open up your email on your phone, and they come with, with a little handheld scanner when you're sitting in the train. They scan the QR code. If it beeps on their system because it validates that you have a good ticket, they look at the seat and they say, you're in the right seat, uh, then, uh, then you're, you're on your way. So what TrainScan does is it just, you take your phone's camera, you scan your QR code, and it generates a passbook pass which has the right geolocalization, has the right time. Uh, well, it can even make a calendar entry. That's an, an option. But basically, when you get to the train station, it shows up on your lock screen. You slide to unlock, you get a QR code, and people, they, they just scan your thing. Now, with Apple Watch, Passbook is on the Apple Watch. They can just scan my watch. It works fine. So I'm just leveraging the power of Passbook. That's literally all this app does. It's a convenience to not having to whip out your email, and maybe you don't have Wi-Fi, maybe, I mean, there's Wi-Fi on the train, but maybe it's dodgy, maybe you forgot to take a screenshot or whatever. It, you know, the second that Via Rail decides, hey, we're gonna send passbook passes along with us QR codes, this app will be completely useless. But I sell this for $12, and it's by far my, most, my biggest money maker. It's the, the app that gets, the, uh, it gets all the five-star reviews, everybody's raving about it, so it's really, it's really the kind of app that people, uh, that people like. And I kind of stumbled into this. And if you look at the statistics, uh, you can see that I have a lot of App Store views. This is just for this one app on Canada compared to the other one that was Daylight that's, that's worldwide. This is fantastic in terms of views. That's because if you search for Via Rail on the App Store, they don't have an app. I have an app. So, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky I'm the only game in town. And conversion rate, like people who buy, there's not a whole lot because it's an expensive app. But it's enough that it's, it's, got, it's got money. I think overall, I looked this morning at App Annie. I've sold about 200. So, you know, 200 to 12 bucks, that's not bad. And it used to be 10 bucks, but then Apple changed the price tier definition for Canada. So the tier 10 became $12. I said to myself, well, do I change this or not? It's just leaving money on the table. I'll just leave it at 12. And I had the same number of sales. Actually, I had a spike during WWDC as I was a um, uh, week as I was in San Francisco, not at WWDC, but at Alt, and just talking to these people. And I saw a spike in sales. Like I sold twice as many as it would sell normally, um, which was cool. So really, I kind of stumbled into something that I want to share with you. Um, so my, my daylight is kind of highly successful. Um, it's got competition, free and paid, but it does pretty well for itself because free is really, really compelling. Um, my, my bus schedule app has no competition locally, but it has a bunch of comparables, and that makes it a target for people to look at and to, to base your price on. Um, 
for train scan, I thought it was kind of skirting the thing about, because I'm essentially redoing their barcode. It turns out that Passbook's, Passbook has a format of a bar barcode that's exactly the right format for Via Rail. So uh, a QR code is just a string, and then you can generate a QR code from it, and Passbook supports that format, so I didn't have to do anything. I don't have to generate any images. It's really sweet. And I wanted this app for myself, because I travel between Ottawa and Montreal all the time, and I wanted to for my friends, and I thought at first, I'm going to sell this app for 99 bucks, and I'm going to give promo codes to my friends. That way nobody will buy it, and it'll still be on the App Store, and it'll be easy to get and do updates. But I thought that was kind of, kind of being douchebaggy, so I, I'm, I'm going to sell for what I thought was a reasonable price of 10 bucks, and I keep selling it at 10 bucks, so, or 12 now. Um, so I actually don't want too many users because if you know word gets around, I don't want to get banned by Via Rail. But so far, every conductor that I've shown it to said, "Hey, this is great. We should we should do this." Or and the first version had Via Rail inside of the the ticket to make it look more like a Via Rail ticket. I changed that very quickly to just say you know Train Scan Canada, and I have a Maple Leaf which is open source. Well, I it's a Creative Commons Maple Leaf. So so basically, what you have to look for is people who are willing to part with money. And I stumbled into this for, for train scan because when you think about it, it doesn't do a whole lot, but it's super convenient for people who travel regularly. And people who travel regularly spend a lot of money on, on train tickets, hundreds of dollars easily. So what's 10 bucks to them? Almost nothing for the super convenience of having directly on your phone lock screen. So, so basically, you want to find users, it, either as you're designing your app or, or even better, before you design your app, that value well-designed software. So I'm convinced you're all doing well-designed software. My software is simple. It does this, this one thing, but it does it really well. It's, I'm, I don't have a designer, so I just use stock UI elements, like I have table views for the, the schedule app. and I, it, It's just pretty simple, but it does it well. And with iOS 7 and 8, it's really handy because the flat uh, look is in, so I don't have to do any Photoshop work to make a glossy thing or whatever, because I, I, I suck at that. So flat is great for me. Um, if you have users, or you have users that can, um, are already bought into a system, Charles Perry sells an app called Benjamin. It's a companion app to the Franklin Diary system. So Franklin, Benjamin. Um, and, uh, if you buy into the whole Franklin system, you'll buy, you're going to buy uh, their paper-based stuff. You're going to buy their computer-based stuff. And sometimes you get a whole company on it so that everybody's on the same kind of scheduling system. And Benjamin helps with that. He sells the app for 20 bucks, and he makes a good living out of it because he's found a niche of users that are, that are already invested into a system, and he, he can augment that ecosystem with this. This is kind of like what I have with TrainScan. They're bought into the system of getting the train ticket and paying money for it, and I can just improve on that experience. Um, there's the whole, that's fine for Marco, which you might have heard in the past. So Marco has uh, good name recognition. People know who he is. He's got a very successful podcast. Now he's got a very successful iOS app. And that's kind of what Jared Sinclair is getting into is like, I don't have the name recognition, but there might be more to it than that because name recognition, honestly, will only get you so far. We are, in this community, we're what I like to call micro-famous. We're very well known in a very small group of people. But if you go outside our community of, of uh, software developers and, and Mac tech heads, there's a really large world out there, as I find out with my STO application, that, I mean, the city of Gatineau has about 400,000 people. And if one in 10 has an iPhone, that's only 40,000 possible to ten, uh, total downloads. And I'm actually approaching that level of saturation number of downloads with this app. Like, I'm getting uh, maybe 10,000 downloads overall, which is really, really good. Um, if you want more information about this and uh, the church of market share, there's an excellent talk by Charles Perry called um, Market Driven Development, which is about finding users that are willing to part with money before you even start your app. Um, he gave this talk at NS North. He also gave it at Alconf, so both videos will be available. This is on the, in, the, um, in the bibliography. So what do I want you to think about when you're, when you're building your app? I want you to think about two pricing levels. The first one, obviously, is free. Free is magical. Um, people will get free apps uh, even without thinking. Maybe some of you are doing it now with my app. So they'll just get the app because it's free, and, uh, and they feel like the, it augments something on their phone. Um, 
maybe you have a back-end service. Like this is what we do at Lightspeed. We give the apps out for free. Like they're, all the iPad and, and mobile app are all free to download. But if you don't have a Lightspeed subscription for the cloud service, they're kind of useless, right? And we don't put the, the, um, the subscription for the cloud service inside the app itself because Apple won't let us without taking a 30% cut, which would be very hard. But um, maybe you have that kind of back-end that you can monetize some other way. That's exactly what Amazon does with their Kindle app. The other price that I want you to think about, I like to call reasonable. So I'm kind of hedging my bets here because reasonable that means a whole lot of different things, uh, especially if you have comparables, that can be hard to find a reasonable price for you. Another word for this would be sustainable. But basically, think about the proportion of dummy users. These users that don't know anything, that leave you a one-star review because they couldn't find uh, that the big button in the middle is what you press to start your app or something. Um, there's a proportion of dummy users, and no, no offense, but there's, it's probably a constant across the population, any population. And if you have more users, overall, you're going to get more dummy users. And more dummy users, it's a lot more support costs because they're going to email you. They're going to they're gonna leave you one-star reviews. They're going to make your life harder in a lot of ways. Um, so think of a support ticket. If you have a support person, and you're lucky enough to have a support person, and you pay that person $20 an hour, 20 euros an hour, and then you have a support ticket that takes two minutes to reply because you want to help this person. Like I had my, my German friend here, I'm going to tell him, you know, you just press this button, everything will be okay. Um, if it takes more than two minutes to reply, that's all, you already wiped out the profit, the 67 cent profit from a, a, an iOS app that's 99 cents. So it's how, how worth it is. It doesn't take long for support to wipe out your, your, your cost, uh, sorry, your revenue. So when you're building your app, Think about your fixed costs and think about your variable costs, especially your variable costs. You'll notice that I put server in both cases. If you have a super local app like I do, like TrainScan is relatively local, it's all in Canada, and the STO app is really hyper local, eh, server costs, I run everything for TrainScan on a $5 a month DigitalOcean instance. That's, you know, that's 60 bucks a year, that's relatively, that's nothing for server costs. But if you're overcast, <laughs> your server costs are like in the, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month uh, for, uh, and when he was running Instapaper, it was a lot more than that. So, so these server costs can be variable. And I also put one-star reviews because we're all told, don't look at your reviews. It's not a good thing. But the truth is, we all look at our reviews, and we get depressed when you get the worst star reviews. And they have a disproportionate effect on our, on our way of, of um, interacting with our customers. Between free and reasonable, there's one thing I didn't talk about here. Uh, even though I have experience with it a little bit, it's freemium. So this is the free with in-app purchase that we all know and maybe love. We've seen it in games and it works really well with games. Um, so a good recent example is 1Password. Um, 1Password, the iOS version, used to be paid. So you paid $5 and you could do 1Password on your phone, which is super handy. And they made a new version and they went uh, free with an app purchase. The idea is we support iOS 8 and up. We have an awesome extension, and it will sync with your Dropbox or will sync with your um, uh, other ways of all, all the other methods of syncing. But if you want, you can unlock some pro features by a $10 in-app purchase. So um, one password on Apple Watch is part of the in-app purchase. I don't know how they got that through review, but it, that's what it is. Um, the time-based one-time passwords, the, the the little digits that change over time, that can all be done either on the watch or on the phone. It's part of the in-app purchase. Uh, multiple vaults is part of the uh, pro feature. So most people won't need these pro features. That's because freemium is hard. All right. Marco, again, has a really good post about this. It's really hard to find a balance of features that will be compelling enough for people to update or to buy these features versus just not using the app for free. And that's especially a problem if you have a back-end service that you pay for that free users can essentially free ride on uh, for, for a while. Marco solves it by only having people with free versions of Overcast only have three podcasts available. Um, uh, and then if you buy, then you can have more on your device. So that saves him a little bit of server cost, which is, which is useful. But it's really hard to find that balance. Um, my experience with freemium is not very good. It, it's, it's really hard to get the conversion because the things that I, the only things I could figure out that would, I would put as freemium, I mean, I could put like the maps or maybe a, 
um, I, you know, why would I put like the holiday schedule as part of a freemium? That doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it should be all, all be part of the basic act, in my opinion, because it's just static data, right? Uh, whereas all the dynamic data, I think, should be, um, should be uh, free. But then again, my experience shows that people are just not willing to pay for that when your free app is good enough. So, in conclusion, what I want you to do is, when you're thinking about your app, know which audience you're writing it for. And hopefully it's an audience that's willing to pay money for it. If you have more users, you're gonna have a lot more increased costs, maybe more than you realize when you start, because market share is expensive. Uh, if you have less users who pay more, you're gonna get lots of five-star reviews because nobody wants to put a one-star review on something they paid a lot of money for. That's just not against, that's against your psyche. It's not gonna work. Um, and I really want you to think in terms of free and reasonable. And you have to think about what reasonable is for you, but that's really what you have to think about. Don't go for the bottom. Don't try to undercut somebody. Go for, um, try to distinguish yourself by making great software, which I'm sure you all do, and then put the price that goes with it so that your users value the stuff more. And really, don't play the lottery. It works for a few people, and they're, you know, they're thinking about getting featured on the App Store and things like that. These things are really nice when they happen, but you can't count on them. Uh, when you're building your app. You really have to think about who's going to buy your app. So in, in conclusion, this is from the keynote by Paul Haddad of Tabas. How many people have TweetBot? All right. It's a great uh, Twitter software. Uh, lots of uh, power user features. I love it. Love Paul. And thank you. So my, my GitHub is uh, github.com slash philipc. That way you can find all my stuff there. Whatever might could work. One, oh, this one works. All right, thank you. Um, question over there. Uh, let's start. One, lots of two, questions. three, awesome. lots of questions. Four. Uh, let's make three hours q and I know I'm the only thing standing between you and a non-vegetarian lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for this inspiring talk. I'm here. <clears throat> I'm quite okay with all the things you say, but globally, don't think that we say that it's not about App Store and Mac App Store and things like that, but don't you think that Apple should make something for us developers because it's quite frustrating, you know? You spent hours and hours and hours developing a program and at least propose something like, they would made it in iBooks. So we can try a book and decide then if we want to buy the software. You're breaking the ground rule, but I will answer your question. <laughs> um, I, if you think you're getting trials, you're not. You're not going to get any trials. Uh, the best thing you're going to get is uh, subscription-based. And as Lex was pointing out yesterday, um, software is probably moving to a subscription basis. It might be a subscription for your whole software. Uh, as opposed to just a, a subscription for like, like a, I could have a subscription for the bus schedule. If you pay 99 cents a year, you get the updates or something like that. And that felt like nickel and diming to me. I'm not sure I wanted to do that, but it is possible if people were pay for that and you're the only game in town, why not try it? Uh, now that the STO is coming out with their data, I might not, because always, it's always, oh, my app's gonna be obsolete. I, I, I live on the edge for this. But in your case, if you're looking for your app, think about something that's gonna be uh, sustainable longer term within Apple's frameworks because Apple's framework is not gonna is not gonna change uh, for you. the old model is gone of uh, of upgrades and trials and stuff so it's really about it's really about playing with what the current rules are and skating where the puck is going which is unfortunately subscriptions so does that answer your question or yeah. okay. it's your your turn I think. Okay, uh, thank you, Phil, for the talk. Um, you've spoken a little bit about knowing your audience. So um, I would actually like to ask you, how would you approach a problem when your market for your app is not local and you are not able to test and know your audience locally? How would you approach that problem? Okay, so uh, I'll give you an example for uh, <laughs> that I got from Singleton last year. So a um, guy, I forget his name, I have a blank, but he was writing an app for spinal surgeons, spinal, spinal cord surgeons, which helped them prepare for their surgeries. So um, 
we asked him, so how many spinal cord surgeons are there in the world? I mean, he can't know them all. It's not a local market. And he said there's roughly about 5,000. If you look at the number of hospitals that do this kind of surgeries and stuff. He said, how, many, how much do you sell your app for? He said 50 bucks, which was, seemed high. But then we realized, A, they're spinal surgeons, and B, there's only 5,000 of them, and they probably don't all have iPads you have to raise the price of your app because you're on a, on a limited market. So that's the kind of insight that you have to think about when you're building your app. Uh, do these people have money? Uh, and, um, or, do you, or do they potentially have money? Or is it, are you go going for uh, emerging markets where the, the value of the software is not the same? Like if you build, uh, well, you know, the lottery is like, like WeChat, right? It's, a, it's an app that exploded outside of the US, because it tends to be very US-centric, all these, this, these Apple rules that Clement was mentioning. Um, but then again, it exploded outside in, in, in emerging markets, and then they got bought for what, $17 billion or something like that? It's a, it's, you know, they, won the, they, they won the lottery, so you can't really count on that, but you have to think about who's the audience and make educated guesses is kind of my, my, my advice there. And if you go for somebody who's like, an, you make an app for dentists, Right? They probably have a, they probably run a practice, they probably have a, some money going on and you can probably charge them a reasonable price for an app and there's less dentists than there would be you know, the general public. So if you find a niche and you look at what's already offered there and you can make an app that's gonna be better than what's there, by all means, that's what you go ahead. Um, it's a lot easier when you have a def defined niche that you can look into to do a little bit more research and figure out what kind of people live in that niche and what kind of money they have versus um, just trying to go scattershot and build a new social network, for instance. Yeah. Um, it's your turn, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, David. Okay, um, I actually have two questions, but first question, uh, you didn't mention ads at all. Correct. So did you try anything with ads? Or no. I don't like apps with ads, so I decided to make not my, my apps without ads. That's an, that's an opinion, that's not, so I don't, ha I don't feel confident showing you any data about this, because A, I don't have it, and B, I haven't done any research on it. Um, I, I'm just annoyed by ads, so I, I, that's why free versus reasonable is the thing. Free with ad supported is possible, there's lots of apps that do that, but um, I'm, honestly, the, the answer that I have for this is I don't know. Um, and I mean, I could find out, but that would take time and that I don't have. Okay, and so the second question would be, uh, what do you think of, well, app upgrades? Like, you remove your old app, paid app, obviously, and you put a new one, so customers have to pay again. So what do you think of this type of model? Right, um, so the question is about upgrades. Um, and app, Apple doesn't offer upgrade pricing, and uh, so essentially when you buy the app, you get all the updates for free until they make a new SKU. Um, and that, that discussion has been had for years, and Apple will not offer upgrade pricing. Don't hold your breath, it's not gonna happen. I'm making bold prediction like, like, like Lex. Um, and um, really the best solution is to have like a launch. Um, but the big problem with, a, like uh, have a launch with a reduced price, the problem with that, or, or that's, the, that's the common wisdom of, of what's going on in the last few years is, yeah, you, you make a, an upgrade price like Fantastical on the Mac, sells for $50, which is like 30 bucks more than they sold before on the Mac. So they made, it, they made a bigger app that's better and they charge more for it. So, but instead of $50 on launch, they sold it for $40. That way people could upgrade for a lower price. The problem with that is, if you look at any App Store launch curve, it's always, First few days, lots of sales, and then it just tapers off really, really quickly unless you have subscription revenue. So um, if you look at Jared's blog post, he said, I shouldn't have done a launch promotion because the people that want to buy my app on launch day, it doesn't matter to them that there's a promotion. And yes, you can, you can never please everyone, but I would recommend against doing a launch promotion when you're going for a new SKU. Um, because you want, because you, you're updating your app. I would just sell the, remove the old app and sell the new app. And if there's a few people that complain, hopefully you're going for less users, not more. You can satisfy them with promo codes because you have more promo codes. Like, is it a hundred now promo codes that we have? Yeah, yeah it's a hundred. So I would use that as my, my bargaining chip. Like if people email you through your support system saying, I can't afford this or whatever, here, have a promo code. 
it's on us. And then you're going to make an advocate for a long time. They're going to, they're going to say, wow, this guy is great. I'm going to tell my friends. So that one promo code that you sent may turn into other sales that you had not anticipated. That would be my recommendation. Don't do a launch promotion. And so you would remove the old app? Yes. Also. That way there's no confusion. Um, and you can, you can just remove it from sale so that it's still, you can still push updates. So people like, let's say you have a bug or a critical bug or a server connection that you need to maintain. You could still push updates, but it's just not available for sale. On, on that okay. note, um, I'm not sure every developer would agree, but me having also um, apps on the side as well. Um, I remember one quote uh, from, um, oh gosh, what's the name of the developer of Delicious Library? Uh, Will Shipley. Will. Okay, Will Shipley, uh, I think back in the days uh, at Evening at Adler, uh, where Wolf was also, that, that was 10 years ago, uh, they were speaking about free licenses, and he was basically saying, well, whoever writes you, just give them. Yeah. And because of this, yeah. I've seen that as well, they become advocates, and really, it's not like you're going to have every, not everybody wants to have a promo code, but if somebody writes you for a promo code, just give them. Just keep a little bank of promo codes and you're, you're ready to go. And there's, some, there's an awesome app, I forget what, Tokens. Tokens. Uh, use you, Tokens. Yeah, usetokens.com. Use that. Yeah. It's the best 20 bucks I ever spent. Two questions. The last two questions, guys, because, um, I mean, I don't want to stop you for, from eating all those vegetables. <laughs> uh, just a short comment. And generally, uh, I agree with the whole... Um, that you should just give, be nice to people, and you know, give them promo codes. It you know, it makes them happy, and you want happy users. You don't want to hold unhappy users prisoner. Um, but um, that said, keep an eye on what you're doing, um, because we had a case where um, we released a new product, and it had a noticeably younger target audience. And uh, with use, of course, they don't have that much money, and they're much more creative and, and have the time to, to make up um, crazy stories and send them to you. And so we started like getting so many requests and started realizing, oh, wait, those are not like, you know, they started like going, oh, I don't have the receipt anymore, and I, it, it got damaged, and I already threw it away, yes. and uh, can you send me a new device and things like that? And so yes. you don't, you want to yes. be... You want to know your audience. I completely agree. I, on the iOS side, it's a, bit, it's a bit easier because you're limited to 100 anyway, so it's going to keep watch for you. Apple won't let you have more promo codes. But yeah, if you're building something or you have Mac software that you can just create licenses for, for sure, keep an eye on it. But that's, that's normal. But it's a lot easier to just reply quickly with a promo code than it is to think about, do I really want to do this? Like, you're wasting mental cycles that you could put, be making your app better or doing support or something like that. But yes. Completely agree. There was another question, one last question? Yeah. Yes. I think it's, it's worth realizing that for most cases, um, like, I mean, you, you were in the lucky situation that you kind of found a niche and that you were the only player. And Absolutely. That you I stumbled into it. I don't make no, I'm not, I'm surprised, but yeah. Yeah, and, and you could kind of uh, gamble on the fact that people would actively search for your app because they were used to have that for other cities or so, and just like thinking, okay, is there something like this for my city too? Yeah. But if you do not have this, this lucky situation, you always have to realize that the app store itself is not a good marketing instrument. Absolutely. You always have to target your, 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 your future customers, yeah. uh, like, like, like you said, even, even before the app is ready for sale outside of the app store, like having a blog, talking to people, for Absolutely. example, the, the, the medical apps, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he, he went to conventions or talk to people from, from magazines, for doctors, or whatever, kind of making, making a subtle promotion for, so for the Some of itself. these things just start with your local community. If you were to talk to your local dentist, and because when you're going for a cleaning, and then you look at what they're using, and you yeah. can talk to them, and it, it, that's how Big Nerd Ranch got started, right? Aaron Hillegas, that's how his whole company got started. He made software orthodontists. And he just started with one dentist, and he became part of Big Nerd Ranch. Yeah, and if, if people are, are lucky because you, you, you just went to them and showed it to them, and if you're lucky and, and they like the app, the, the people itself or the people themselves will, will make promotion for your app without heavy, ever just having something of it. Agreed. Yeah, yeah totally. You'd be happy at the number of uh, crappy MS-DOS apps still around. Speaking of doctors, or uh, like I was at a shop buying an HDMI cable two days ago, and a PC specialist or whatever, and they had this MS-DOS thingy. Yeah, 
That's a real POS system, not an actual POS system. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Philippe. Round of applause for him. Oh, before we're done. So, so Stuff has been really nice to all of us, and he's been really nice to me, and he's been giving gifts to people. Yeah. So I have a gift for oh, you. Oh, but you have a gift for me. Okay, cool. You brought something from Mar I did. Marple Syrup. It's vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this is really cool. I was just going to grab your cap, so you'll get your cap. Oh, some speakers I probably forget to give a cap, so just uh, uh, ask me. By the way, I, g I um, just received a message on my wrist from Robin, uh, which said she was sorry to not say uh, bye to everybody, but she really enjoyed being here. And I found it funny, she wrote, uh, it proved uh, once again that the programmer is just a stereotype, uh, because you guys are all awesome. So, yeah. Um, all right, so let's go grab some lunch. And uh, we'll be back in like three quarter or something like that. <laughs>